Hello, and welcome to the City of Snoqualmie's Virtual Citizens Academy. My name is James Wharton Hess. I'm the Management Fellow here, and I'll be discussing the role of the Finance Department and explore some of the topics we deal with on behalf of the City. This is the agenda for today. We're going to start with a short overview of the Department and a high-level summary of what the Department is responsible for. Then, we're going to quickly discuss some of the challenges that the Department faces, as well as discuss the financial reporting function of the Department. After that, we're going to spend a little bit of time on the City's major revenue sources and focus in on property tax and the unique, unique system we have here in Washington. Finally, I'll walk through the financial planning and budgeting process and how the City pr prepares and implements the biennial budget. Hello, I'm Robert Hamoud. I'm the Finance Director here at the City of Snoqualmie, and I've been with the City since May of 2018. Today I'm going to discuss to you what my role is uh, with the City and um, some of the challenges and opportunities um, that arise with the Finance Department. So first I would like to share the org chart of our department with you. So again, we have the Finance Department. The Finance Director is on the top, of course, and I report to the City Administrator and the Mayor. The Financial Services Manager um, is under me. Um, currently that's served by Jerry Knudsen. And under that is an account clerk, an accountant, and then under me is a financial analyst, a senior account clerk, an office assistant, utility clerk, and a management fellow position. And so we have about nine staff members. We service every department in the city, and I'm going to go over our role a little bit here. So the finance department is very unique in the city because it, it does serve both internal and external customers. And so, again, we service each department. We make sure that they have the functions they need, they make sure they have the, the funding they need. Uh, we process all of their invoices for equipments and supplies but at the same time we also serve an external function uh, most people know us as the people that you pay your utility bills to and your business licenses to and we also uh, do compliance for those so again we do um, assist with shutoffs for delinquent bills for utilities. Uh, we do assist with collections for business license and enforcement for um, those individuals that are outside of compliance of the law here at the city. So as part of that, um, what we try to do is play a leadership role. We try to educate the public on what we do. Um, we try to use our enforcement powers as a last ditch effort. We want to really make sure that we're good community partners. Um, we want to, you know, convey what we're doing at all times to the community. We try to do um, regular checkups at the community. We do inserts on our bills for utilities to tell you what's going on. Uh, we do quarterly reports to council on finance and some of the activities here at the city. Um, so internally, what our, what our role here as the city is, again, we, we pay the bills, of course. So the accounting department is under the finance. Um, payroll is the critical role for us. Taxes, licenses, fees. So again, um, with the exception of fines, which are handled by the Issaquah Municipal Court through a contract, um, we handle any kind of taxes and fees and licensure that comes in. Um, some of it... Um, if you pay for a building permit, some of it is handled upstairs, but in the end we collect and receipt the money here at the city. Um, we also do all the financial planning and we do all the budgeting for the city. So we assist the departments with not just where they're going to be at this year, but where they're going to be at in the next five to seven years. Um, and so an analysis and forecasting is something we do a lot of. Investment and debt, investments and debt. Um, I serve also as the state treasurer, or excuse me, city treasurer in my function. So we handle the city's investment portfolio, um, and also. Um, one other item, too, that I did want to mention is we also play a key role in the continuity of operations during an emergency. And over the past um, six months here, of course, with the COVID outbreak at the city, um, with our services limited, uh, the finance department has played a lead role in that continuity of operations, meaning um, making sure that we're still paying our bills on time, making sure we're still doing our invoices, making sure the government is still functioning, even with a closed city hall. So that meant retraining staff, having remote operations, changing certain policies to make sure that that continuity of operations happens. Uh, same thing um, after an emergency, whether it be a flood, whether it be a snowstorm, whether it be the, a pandemic such as COVID, uh, we're the ones that at the end of the day submit the reimbursements <clears throat> to the federal government and the state governments as needed for reimbursements of those those funding, <clears throat> those funding sources. And so we do reach out to those agencies. We work a lot of we work a lot with King County on um, intergovernmental funding that comes to the city. We also manage the grants for the city as well. Um, 
And so we're dealing with a lot of partners, as I mentioned before, both internal and ex external stakeholders on almost everything we do here at the city. Uh, so it's a very busy position, very busy job. Um, the city does have a biennial budget that James is going to explain a little bit later in this, this process um, today. And so what that means is we are actually aiming for the long term of everything we do here. So instead of looking at day-to-day -day operations, we keep those functioning, but we try to keep the big picture um, in our eyes at all times. And even if it might be uncertain, it's the role of finance to really try to communicate and educate the city council, the staff, and the stakeholders and the citizens in the community on where the city is headed and what its position is in. And so there's a lot of that and a lot of making sure that, you know, we're monitoring the sales tax collections at the city. We're making sure, you know, we're seeing how the businesses are doing within the city and we're making sure that our, our revenues are sound to fund our expenditures and that we're focused on a balanced budget each year. As, as again, James will explain in the future presentations that we are under state law to provide our, our citizens here. Um, we also um, ensure that payroll is done for um, the city of North Bend's fire uh, police function, which is also handled under the Snoqualmie Police Department. So that does stretch out. Um, sometimes we do provide technical assistance to um, smaller local agencies in the valley as needed, and also other cities in the valley as needed as well. So the next topic I'd like to discuss are the challenges um, that the fire finance department uh, handles on pretty much an everyday basis. First of all, the finance department much, must manage the various deadlines and responsibilities. Um, as I mentioned before, we service internal and external stakeholders <clears throat> in providing that service. And especially with kind of the new normal that we find ourselves in here in 2020, um, there's a lot of challenges um, that we did not have even six months ago. And so part of that challenge is to maintain um, same level of customer service wall having nine staff members all working remotely from their home locations 90% of the time. So that's been a challenge for us and to still provide, you know, dedicated customer service hours that customers and residents can call in, make sure they get their services needed and, and make sure that we can address um, all the invoices, pay the invoices in a timely manner and redress all inquiries to the city um, that are finance related in a timely manner as well. So we want to make sure that we're still keeping the customer in mind even during um, this challenging year that we're having. And also that goes with internal needs. The ability to serve the diverse needs of each and every city department and staff the council meetings and committees. So uh, finance plays a key role um, with working with city council. Um, we staff the finance and administration committee that meets every two weeks and we provide um, a lot of information on finances and a lot of response to inquiries from city council. We do things like we talked about the debt management, utility rates, all that information um, is provided to council. So that does take additional analysis and staffing on our end and kind of juggling multiple projects at once to make that work. And also adding that the public and council, the public inquiries or citizen inquiries that come in, public records requests that come in as well, finance plays a key role in, in providing that information to the public. And so again, ensuring that clear communication with departments is critical. Um, we've changed the way we've done business a little bit. Um, obviously going to an online platform, getting comfortable with online meetings and servicing. Um, the other challenge we have too is uh, finance does take a lead role in managing the city's enterprise resource system, which is the IT system that runs the accounting, the payroll, um, the financial management of the city. And that is also, you know, can be time consuming. There can be challenges if, you know, the system goes down, obviously people can't get paid. So that's a big challenge of ours to, to keep that running, to keep that communication clear with the IT staff and also with the, the software vendor that we have. And so the next topic here I'm going to discuss is financial reporting. So per state law, RCW 4309230, the city must submit an annual financial report to the state. And so this report, um, and even this year, the report has a deadline that I believe is in June and is not flexible. So even this year we asked for an extension we couldn't. So that's something where that's part of the challenge where we want to, we need to make sure that we get that financial report clear and accurate every year. Every year there's some changes to those schedules. And so our financial reporting manager, Jerry Knudsen, takes a lead role um, with our accountant to prepare that information and submit it on time in, in an accurate and timely manner to the um, state auditor's office. So the city follows 
the bar's cash basis accounting structure. And so it's a uniform coding system statewide. And at the same time, in Washington State, the state auditor's office performs the annual audits for each local government entity. And so they determine what the rules are, they determine what changes in structure that might happen. And so constantly our financial services manager, as well as our accountant, they are uh, following all the changes as they come up and they're, they're doing a lot of training and a lot of coordination with the state auditor's office to make sure we're staying on top of everything. Um, the state auditor's office performs annual audits. Uh, that requires um, obviously a lot of preparation from the staff. A lot of the things they look at for that auditing process are transactions to make sure they're accurate, credit card receipts, for example. Um, payroll and pay stubs to employees and so having a, a large data set having a large file and making sure we're prepared for all the questions they have that happens on an annual basis um, due to um, just the state staffing needs and the fact that they're auditing tens of thousands of entities within Washington uh, the the uh, we don't have a set time each year that the auditors come in. Sometimes they'll come in in the summer. Sometimes they'll come in in the fall. If they have a busy year, sometimes they'll even come in um, over a year later after the fiscal year is done. So again, our fiscal year is January 1st to December 31st each year. So we're in a, a calendar fiscal year per se. And so each year that the auditors come in, they're looking at the, the previous year. So if they came in, say, in September this year, they're looking at the 2019 financials for the city. And so the process usually takes about you know, two to three months um, once it gets going. And then at the end of that process, the auditors come up with their report. They present their report um, to both the management here and the city council as well. Uh, for dissemination and recommendations and each year the f if there's there's usually exit recommendations which are a standard process with the state auditor's office and with um, just a normal accounting process just areas where they say hey you can maybe do this you can maybe do that um, it's up to the financial reporting manager and the accounting staff to make sure that we're <clears throat> adhering to those best practices and those changing requirements. Um, very happy to say that the city has gone over 10 years at this point with a very clean audit and no findings, so we have a very good record and track record, and we, we hope to keep that up in the future, of course. And you can look for further information on our financial reports on our website, as listed on the slide here. Thank you. So now that we've heard from our finance director about um, how the department is structured, what we do, and the financial reporting requirements as well as our challenges, I wanted to get into the city's revenue. And in particular, um, I wanted to spend some time discussing Snoqualmie property tax. So the pie chart shown here depicts the city's general fund revenue in 2019. This money pays for things like police and fire services as well as parks and street maintenance. As you can see, almost half of the city's general fund revenue is derived from property tax. Other major sources include utility tax and sales tax. Because of this revenue mix, the city of Snoqualmie can handle economic downturns somewhat better than cities that rely heavily on things like sales tax. This is because sales tax fluctuates based on the overall economy much more so than property and utility tax. In essence, the public is generally more likely to stop shopping and eating out before stopping their utility bill payments or paying property tax. Therefore, a heavy reliance on sales tax is great in good times, but often intensifies negative budget impacts during economic downturns. As our single largest generator of general fund revenue, I will spend some time here going through the basics of Snoqualmie property tax. It is important to note that property tax funds many things other than the city's operations. In fact, for every dollar paid in property tax, only about 20 cents goes to the city. 10 cents goes to King County, 37 cents goes to the Snoqualmie Valley School District, 23 cents goes to the state school fund, and about 10 cents goes to other entities like the King County Library System, the Snoqualmie Valley Hospital, the EMS levy, the Port of Seattle, and the King County Flood Control District. So of the 20 cents that goes to the city, about 6% funds the Snoqualmie Police Department, four cents funds the fire department, another four cents funds citywide administration, and that includes the finance department, about three cents funds parks, and the remaining three cents funds community development. 
So let's assume I'm a Snoqualmie homeowner who pays $8,000 in property tax each year. In this scenario, I'm paying about $480 to support the Snoqualmie Police Department, $320 to support the Fire Department, and $240 to support the operations and maintenance of the city's park system. As stated earlier, reliance on property tax is a relatively good way to weather financial downturns. However, it does have some challenges that stem from its limitations. The most significant limitation on property tax is the 1% annual levy lid limit. This restricts how much the city levy amount can grow each year and was enacted due to concerns about property tax rising faster than inflation. In essence, the city cannot increase the levy amount more than 1% or the rate of inflation each year, whichever is lower, plus an additional amount generated by new construction and add-ons. As I stated earlier, reliance on property tax is a relatively good way to weather financial downturns. However, it also has some challenges that stem from its limitations. The most significant limitation on property tax is the 1% annual levy lid limit. This restricts how much the city's levy amount can grow each year and was enacted due to concerns about property taxes rising faster than inflation. In essence, the city cannot increase the levy amount more than 1% or the rate of inflation each year, whichever is lower, plus an additional amount generated by new construction and add-ons. Despite concerns that led to the passage of this limit, the converse has proven to be true, and that inflation is rising much faster than the 1% limit on property tax revenue. So the graph here depicts the rate of inflation for the Seattle-Tacoma-Bellevue region according to the Consumer Price Index, CPI, over the last 10 years. That's pictured here in blue. The orange line below represents the 1% annual increase in property tax revenue allowable under state law. As a result, in order to continue to provide the same level of service provided in 2010, the city is constantly looking for ways to fill this ever-growing gap between property tax revenue and the cost of providing services. A question often asked of elected officials and city staff alike is how much will I pay in property tax next year? Unfortunately, the answer is largely dependent on factors outside of the city's control and that the city may not even be aware of. In essence, it depends. It's important to keep in mind the complexities of the property tax system, which I'll briefly cover in the next few slides. It depends on the actions of other jurisdictions, such as King County, the state, the Snoqualmie Valley School District, and any new voter approved levies. It also depends on any changes in your property's valuation compared to that of your neighbors. Finally, the answer depends on the timely sharing and flow of information from the King County Assessor's Office, who ultimately coordinates the property tax system. The state of Washington operates under a budget-based system for property taxes. In this system, the city establishes its desired levy amount first. That's the total it will receive subject to several restrictions, including the 1% cap discussed earlier. Then, the assessed valuation is used to calculate the subsequent levy rate that property owners must pay. The formula is expressed here in red. Essentially, the total levy amount is divided by the total value of all city property in thousands. This equation will give you the levy rate per thousand dollars of a property's assessed valuation. Another way to look at this is expressed at the bottom in red. Take your property value and divide it by the total city property value, this information is provided by King County each year, and multiply that by the levy amount. This will give you the regular city levy portion of your property tax. Now that we have gone over the budget-based property tax system, I'm going to try to answer another property tax question that is often asked. How could my city regular levy share of property tax have changed at a rate other than zero to 1% if the city can only collect an additional 0 to 1% per year? The answer is that this could be a result of many things, but it is probably due in large part to your property's valuation in comparison to your neighbors. As an example, if your home's value increases at a greater rate than your neighbors, according to the King County Assessor's Office, you will pay a larger percent of the city's regular levy, while your neighbors will pay less. Because I have likely either bored or confused you, with the complexities of property tax at this point, we will move on 
However, I have included a link to the King County Assessor's Office tax transparency tool here for your reference. This site will allow you to see your property's valuation, the city's total valuation, show how much money in property tax you pay to different entities, and even help predict your next property tax bill, among other things. Now that we've discussed property taxes, the final topic I will cover is the city's financial planning and budgeting process. The city operates on a biennial budget model, meaning the budget process is completed every two years and authorizes city spending for the following two year period. The budget is broadly broken up into two major parts, the operating budget and the capital budget. The operating budget includes things like salaries and wages, services and supplies, small equipment, and other spending related to the ongoing operations of the city. The capital budget includes major capital projects and programs such as road construction, utility line replacements, and new park construction. Capital budgets typically reflect the city's six-year CIP document, or Capital Improvement Plan. The timeline here predicts the ideal financial planning process. While the actual dates vary for numerous reasons, like council priorities and the economic environment, the general order of events is pretty standard. The Finance Department is constantly monitoring and analyzing the budget, revenue, and spending to quickly identify and confront potential financial issues. In the latter part of the first year, the Finance Department will provide a mid-term budget review to City Council in order to highlight any existing or anticipated variations from the adopted budget. Then, in the early part of year two, the City Council and departments will begin their strategic planning process and review their existing goals and objectives to identify any associated budget implications. Soon thereafter, staff will begin updating the capital improvement plan to revise revenue forecasts, update project cost expectations, and propose any new projects or programs for City Council consideration. Finally, in the latter part of the second year, staff and the mayor will use the data collected in the previous steps to prepare and present a proposed biennial budget to City Council, who will review the plan and make any amendments before officially adopting it prior to the end of the year. Starting with budget monitoring and analysis. The finance staff is continually monitoring and analyzing the budget to ensure that departments are on track with their spending. In addition, the department works closely with project managers and engineers to ensure that capital project costs also stay within budget. As a part of this duty, the Finance Department reviews all proposed council actions that have a financial implication and analyze them to determine the budget effect of the proposal and what solutions might exist to offset any unanticipated new spending. Finally, the City monitors actual revenues received compared to the forecast. Should revenues fail to meet expectations, it is important that the cause be determined and that any necessary budget modifications are made to address the gap. Near the end of the first year, the Finance Director prepares and presents a mid-term biennial budget review to City Council. The review is an analysis of the budget progress and includes suggested budget modifications if necessary. This review offers the staff, mayor, and City Council the chance to incorporate any previously unforeseen changes into our financial plan. It is then time to turn to the biennial budget. At this point, early in the second year of the biennium, City Council either reviews its goals and objectives or, in the case of new City Councils, develops new goals and objectives for the following two-year period. These goals guide the entire financial planning process and act as a crucial planning tool in the formulation of the Mayor's agenda and department work plans. The following two slides list the current City Council goals. The current City Council goals are Number one, to provide an economic base that supports long-range city revenue goals. Number two, is to provide a budget and financial plan based on approved department goals. Three, is to proactively maintain and sustainably replace needed city infrastructure that meets current and future needs. Four, is to provide and protect services, spaces, facilities, and events that enhance residents' quality of life. Number five is to advocate for multimodal accessibility to and from Snoqualmie to maintain or improve levels of service. 
Number six is to preserve and facilitate additional affordable housing for the workforce, seniors, and special needs residents. Finally, number seven is to improve our communications, understanding, and transparency within city government and with those who we serve. And hopefully that's something we're doing here today. Another crucial planning process, CIP development, takes place around the beginning to middle part of the second year of each biennium. Finance Department first determines the existing and anticipated resources available for CIP projects and programs. This includes existing cash on hand, as well as anticipated new revenue. An internal staff committee then analyzes proposed projects and programs and scores them based on predetermined criteria and makes a final recommendation to the mayor. Finally, the mayor proposes a capital improvement plan to city council for deliberation and eventual adoption. The last step in the financial planning process is biennial budget development whereby the entire planning process is boiled down to a two-year spending plan for the city. As part of this process, departments use performance measures to determine areas of proficiency and areas of needed improvement and make budget enhancement requests as needed. The finance department projects revenue and develops a budget model for sustainably achieving the mayor and city council's priorities. The mayor then reviews enhancement requests and the preliminary budget draft, requests any alterations, and submits a formal budget proposal to City Council. Finally, City Council deliberates, formally requests amendments, and eventually adopts the biennial budget. Then the process starts all over again. To wrap things up, I've provided an email address and phone number to call if you'd like any additional information on the Finance Department. Thank you for letting us share a little bit about the finance department and what we do, and we sincerely appreciate your participation. Thanks again.